Well, this morning we're going to be looking at a few verses out of Ephesians chapter 1. So I I want to begin by reading um, Ephesians 1, if I am not mistaken. I want to read beginning in verse 1. And I um, want to read through verse 14. So this is what the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Now, there's, there's a lot of things that are said in here. And sometimes it's difficult to know exactly everything that Paul is saying, especially when he uses these very lengthy run-on sentences. I believe verses 3 through 14 in the Greek is just one continuous sentence. Uh, we've been taught today not to write sentences quite that long because it's kind of hard to get all that in without any stops, any full stops. Stop and think, you know. But um, that, that's not the way it was written, and that's fine. We have time to sit and dissect it. But what I want us to do is look primarily at verse, verses 11 and 12. We have an inheritance. We have been predestined to this according to God's purpose. He is the one who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, we are going to look at, the, at working all things to the counsel of his will this evening. That's the broader topic. This morning, we want to look at the fact that we have been predestined. We have been predetermined. Our, our destiny has been predetermined by the Lord from all eternity that we would be adopted and that we would be uh, those who would be the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. So let's just begin by uh, connecting this to what we saw last week. Remember, last week we finished looking at the most important things that the Bible teaches, those things that make up the gospel. And let me just mention that we have been blessed to hear these things. There's still many people in the world who have never heard the gospel. We are blessed to have heard it. But as we've already been reminded, there are those who hear it who never actually receive the Lord Jesus Christ, who never believe it. So we are blessed not only to hear it, But we are blessed also to be those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to look this morning at why it is that that is the case. We know that Paul writes in Romans 10 verse 17 that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But why is it that some hear and believe and others hear and they don't believe? Now, one last thing I want to say about the gospel before we we sort of set it aside, although we never really set it aside because everything that we're talking about is 
the gospel. It's connected to it, particularly when we're talking about the subject we're talking about this morning. But as we leave the fundamentals, those essential teachings of the gospel, let's remember that leading somebody to life in the Lord Jesus Christ is, is as simple as sharing this message. I've already mentioned not everybody who hears it is going to be saved, but there will be those who do hear it and who do believe because of the Lord's mercy. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.21, For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, and he's essentially telling us here that we cannot come to know the Lord in a saving way through philosophy, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The gospel is how the Lord saves. That is the seed in the seed sower's bag that gets spread into the different soils. That's what we need to be armed with, equipped with, and that's what we need to share with others if we hope to see them come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this morning we're going to back up to the foundation of this salvation. Backing up before the gospel actually reached us, before Jesus came into the world, before God made his gracious covenants with his people, before the fall, even before creation, all the way back into eternity to see that saving us was something that has always been in the mind and on the heart of God. Again, let me read the passage, the two verses I told you that we're going to be looking at uh, this morning and this evening. We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Now, first of all, Paul tells us in this passage that we now have something that we did not have when we first came into the world. We're reminded in Scripture when we first came into the world what we had was sin. What we had was Adam's sinful nature. What we had was a disposition against God. What we had was essentially a pronouncement of judgment against us, the judgment of hell. But Paul tells us in our passage, now we have an inheritance. Now this inheritance he's talking about is the kingdom that now belongs to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are his heirs. Now, that kingdom belongs to us right now, but we also know that we will receive it in the future. After we have passed on from this world, once we've finished living our lives for the glory of God, once we've done everything that he intends for us to do, after we've spent perhaps thousands of years in heaven, uh, waiting, as it were, for the Lord to gather in all of his people so he can finally bring the, the consummation, after the rapture, and the resurrection and the final judgment, then we will receive that inheritance. What he's really speaking about here is that are the new heavens and the new earth, where heaven and earth again become one, and where the Lord is going to live among us, even as he did at the beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden, where he is going to fill us with his presence, where he's going to bless us and care for us for the rest of time. Paul says that that is actually what we now have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul tells us that this is really what God has planned to give us before he made the world, back in eternity. He writes in verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined, that is, predetermined from, from eternity. He also writes in verses 4 and 5, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. So what Paul is telling us here is essentially this, that before God created all that he made, and the world is really a summary term, for the heavens and the earth, for everything that essentially is created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The world is the cosmos. It certainly includes everything we see, everything we can't see, and perhaps includes heaven as well. 
But before God created anything that he had made, in his eternal counsels, Paul tells us he made a choice. He chose us in Christ. Now, the interesting thing is understanding that God is always the same and he never actually changes. Even though he represents it to us as a choice, um, it's really an eternal purpose in God. We might say it's something that God has always wanted to do. Now, when we want to do something, it's, it's really quite different with us because when we want to do something, we usually have to sit down and, and plan it. You know, the plan of vacation, we don't just hop in a car and, and just drive off. We, we think about where we're going. We think about where we want to go. We think about whether we have enough money to do what it is we want to do. We think about whether that's the right direction that we want to be going. Uh, we make plans to make large purchases. We plan for retirement. We have to sit down and we have to work through it step by step. But we don't want to impose that on God because God is not the same as us in this way. God does not have to make a plan. God has always had a plan. God is a God who never changes in any way because he knows everything that he intends to do. He has a comprehensive plan, a plan that has been in his mind from all eternity. We might put it this way, that God has always desired to do exactly what he's done and what he's doing. What we have seen happening from the creation of the world to the present day is exactly what God intends would be done. Now, part of that comprehensive plan was that we would belong to him. We would be his. It included, of course, everything that, that went into this, his purpose or his choice, as it were, to send his son who, through whose work or whose work would pave the way for the sending of the Holy Spirit who would place us in the Lord Jesus Christ by applying what Jesus did to us. Now, we need to realize that God's plan includes the sending of our Lord Jesus Christ because God could not have chosen us in any other way except in Christ. We do need to remember, you know, uh, who we were when we came into this world, as I've already mentioned. We were rebels against the Lord. We rebelled against him in the garden. We were his enemies. We were under his judgment. God could never have let us come into heaven in the condition in which we came into this world. Habakkuk once prayed to the Lord in Habakkuk 1.13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Only the righteous are going to live with the Lord. Only the holy can actually dwell with him in heaven. So the Lord determines in eternity to make us holy, essentially to give us that love, that affection for what is right that he has. He determined in eternity that he would make us blameless, that he would take away our guilt by sending his son into the world so that he might adopt us into his family that we might be his sons and daughters, so that Jesus might be the firstborn among a people who are like him, so that he might have the honor, uh, the first place among a people who belong to him. And God make this, made this choice so that we might share in the privileges of being the children of God. And we know there's a lot of blessings that actually come from this. Again, they're all free. They're all purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to earn them. We've talked about that last week, our justification, which makes us entitled to this adoption, which gives to us all of these blessings, is purely by the grace of God. But all these blessings come to us freely from the Lord, His Spirit to make us alive, to convince us that we belong to Him, to work in us, to make us like Him his fatherly care for our needs while we're in this world and his protection against our enemies. But again, also the blessing of being his heirs. We will inherit the new world that he is going to create when his son returns. Now, this is what the Lord has chosen us for. 
He has chosen to give us these blessings in his Son. And this is purely, again, entirely of God's free grace and mercy. Now, this is also why our Lord Jesus tells us that we should not really concern ourselves with this world or the things of the world. Now, there's certain things we do need to be concerned about, but our concern needs to be placed in a different place, not in whether we're going to get these things, but they need to be placed in the Lord who gives us these things as a part of His provision, as a part of His inheritance, as a part of the blessing of being a part of His family. He tells us that we should not try to become rich, that we shouldn't try to gather up too much of the world's goods because, he says, the desire for money, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many pangs, with many difficulties. Um, you know, the desire for money can ruin us. Jesus says, don't fix your eyes upon money. He also says that we're not to worry about whether our needs are going to be ultimately met because the Lord says that he will meet those needs. But rather, he says, since I've given you this kingdom and I've promised it to you in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what you and I need to be seeking after because it's worth more than this world and a hundred worlds like this world and a thousand worlds like this world. It's worth more than all the wealth of the universe. Jesus tells us in Luke 12, verses 29 through 34, based upon the fact that the Lord is going to give us this kingdom, he says this, and do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." So the point is, the Father has chosen us. He has purposed from all eternity to give us this kingdom. And He has worked it out in time by sending us His Son. And Jesus tells us this, that if He was willing to give us Him, if He was willing to give us His Son, how will He not also with Him give us everything that He has promised in the Lord Jesus? We don't need to worry. Fear not, He says, little flock, the Father has gladly chosen to give you this kingdom. Now, this is what the Lord has done. The Lord tells us in his word, Paul tells us in the passage we just looked at, and we saw, of course, in Romans chapter 9 as well, that the fact that we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is not due to us, but it is due to a choice that God made in eternity, the fact that we're going to inherit uh, heaven, uh, the eternal kingdom of heaven, the fact that we are heirs right now is not something we did. It's not something we worked our way into. It's not something we chose of our own free will, although we did once the Lord quickened us to life, but it's something that he brought about, and it was based upon a choice he made in eternity. But the second question I want to ask is this, why did he do this? Why did he do it for us? Well, Paul actually gives us two reasons, and again, both of them have nothing to do with us, but they have everything to do with him. The first one is in verses 4 and 5. And uh, this, this has not really been divided up the way it should be. You'll notice the last two words in verse 4 are actually the first two words of verse 5. But this is what he says. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Why did God do this? He didn't do it because of us. He did it because of himself. He did it because of love. Now, the fact that he did this out of love should not surprise us. After all, it's included in the most quoted verse of all the Bible. It's what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It shouldn't surprise us because we are so used to hearing this verse 
But on the other hand, it should surprise us because of what Jesus actually is saying here. While we were still in our sins, while we were still dead and a part of this world, God loved us and sent his son to save us. But of course, what should surprise us even more is that God's love being a discriminating love, meaning he chooses some and not others, he chose actually to love us. He placed his affections upon us. Now think about what we read earlier in Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 13 about Jacob and Esau. Paul writes this, and not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything, good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, he's talking about their works, but because of him who calls, that is God who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad. Now there's a story that Spurgeon told, maybe I'm sure you've, you've heard this before, of a woman who came up to him one time, asking him about this verse. I have a problem with this verse, she said to Spurgeon. Spurgeon said, you do, I have a problem with this verse too, but what, what's your problem? Well, she goes, I don't understand what it says here, how God could hate Esau. After all, isn't God a God of love? I mean, he loves everyone. He doesn't hate anyone, does he? Well, Spurgeon said, that's not my problem. I can understand how God could hate Esau, that wicked man. If you, if you look back in, in the Old Testament, you read about the life of Esau. This guy was, was wicked. He says, that's not my problem, how he could hate Esau. It's easy to see how he could hate Esau. My problem is, how could he love Jacob? I mean, look at Jacob. He wasn't that much better, was he? He was the one who was continually trying to steal his brother's blessing from him. He was the one who deceived his father and robbed his brother of that blessing. Now, Spurgeon, of course, really understood how God could love Jacob. But it, he, what he meant was, how could he love a sinner like this? He couldn't because of Jacob. Jacob was a sinful man. We're all, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The love comes from God. It's not drawn out by the object. It, it is basically coming from God and God alone. We've sinned. We've all fallen short. We all deserve God's hatred. But yet he chose to love us, sending his son to save us and bring us to heaven. You know, Paul is saying essentially the same thing in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, where he writes this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. By the way, I was drawing from this verse a little bit earlier, perhaps, you know, he, he predestined us to become like Jesus so that Jesus would be the firstborn, that is, the one who would have the preeminence, the one who would be first among a race of redeemed men who share his nature, who are just like him. He would be the head of this new humanity, redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I want us to look at here is this, the word foreknow. This foreknowing here doesn't mean that God simply knew something ahead of time, such as knowing who would choose him. Looking ahead down the quarters of time, God knew who was going to choose him, and so he, he chose them. Now, we do know that God knows absolutely everything because God ordained everything that's going to come to pass. It's all a part of his, of his plan. I mean, he knows everything, doesn't he? And that plan is eternal. He knows not only what's going to happen, he knows what could happen under any given circumstances, but this is not talking about his comprehensive knowledge. It refers rather to a loving beforehand because I want you to notice it's not saying what God foreknew, it's saying whom he foreknew. These are individuals that he foreknows. He's using the word here essentially the same way that it's used when it says in Genesis chapter 4, 
Adam knew his wife Eve. He loved her in a very intimate way. What he's saying here is, what Paul is saying is that God loved us. He foreloved us before the foundation of the world. And not because of what he would see us do, because he knew apart from his grace and his mercy in our lives, all he would see would be our rebellion, our sinfulness, our hatred, and our desire to get away from him. He would not see us coming to him and choosing him. So it's not because of what he sees. It's because of the love that he has for us. Paul defines this even a little bit more closely in Ephesians 1.5 where he calls this choice that he made out of his love the kind intention of his will, which simply means because of his kindness or to put it in another, another way, he did it because it was his pleasure to do it. And you know how when you love someone, it's your pleasure to do good things for them. It was God's pleasure to choose us because he loved us. But that love did not come from us. We did not move him to love us. He chose to love us. He has loved us forever. There's never been a time when he didn't love us. And because he loves us, he has predestined us to adoption. He has called us by his word and his spirit. He's justified us. And he tells us one day he will glorify us. So the first reason why God chose us is because of love. Now, the second reason he chose us was because he wanted to draw attention to his love. Okay? He wanted to draw attention to his grace. Look at verse 11 in Ephesians 1. He says, To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And then in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. God wanted us to experience his love, his grace, his mercy, all that he has to give us, the redemption that's in Jesus, the forgiveness, the change of nature, everything, the whole package, so that we might thank him, so that we might praise him, that we might give him the honor, that we might give him the credit for the great mercy that he has shown us. Now, that's one of the reasons he did it, is so that we would praise him. The second reason is that so that the angels would praise him. One of the things we're told about in Scripture is that as the angels, uh, well, as God is doing his work of saving us, sending his son into the world and everything that he does, the angels are watching. You know, they're, they're, also, they're, they're involved in it as well, aren't they? They were the ones who were created to minister to those who would inherit salvation. Well, they watch what the Lord is doing and they're, they're thinking probably to themselves, this is amazing, this, this grace, this mercy upon these people who hate him. They even took his son and nailed him to a cross. But God is showing mercy to them. And so they're, they're overwhelmed and they're amazed and they're praising God for his mercy. So he wanted to glorify his mercy also in the sight of the angels, giving them reason to praise him. And of course, he wants us also to be an example to others that he might bring them to himself as they see the grace of God working in our lives. By the way, this, this response of praise, which, you know, God loves us so that we might praise him for that love, that response, that's one of the reasons why the Lord calls us to meet together on this day, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, so that we can encourage one another to do exactly this. You know, when there's when there's just maybe like a few people that are here in the morning, uh, say like, you know, when, when it's 10 o'clock and we're, we're just getting started, I, I can feel my own heart just sink to the floor. I'm just thinking, you know, are, is, is, is this going to be, everyone's going to gather to, to worship the Lord on this particular day. But when the Lord brings more people in and it gets a bit fuller and we see more who are here desiring to worship the Lord, that really encourages me. I'm sure it encourages the rest of you, too, to give the Lord praise and honor. I mean, why doesn't he tell us just to meet in our homes and our closets individually and do it? It's difficult to do it when you're by yourself, much more difficult than when we're gathered together to worship because our desire to do it encourages one another to do exactly this same thing. 
So that's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to meet. He wants us to praise. He wants us to thank him and to bless him for the love he has given to us. And remember the parable? That wasn't a parable. It was actually an event in the life of Jesus where he's in Simon's house. And uh, while he's there, Simon's showing him no hospitality at all. And this woman comes in and she's weeping and she wets his feet with her tears and wipes them with her hair. And then Simon is sitting there just despising this woman because he knows what kind of a woman she is. And if this man were really a prophet, he wouldn't allow her to do this. And Jesus turns to Simon and he says, Simon, you see this woman. He goes, you know, I came into your house, you didn't wash my feet, but since, you know, I've, since she's been here, she's been washing my feet with her tears and wiping them with, with her hair. And the reason why she's doing that, Simon, is because her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Because the one who is forgiven much is thankful much, but the one who is forgiven little is thankful little. If we understand what the Lord has actually given to us, what he's forgiven us, what he has blessed us with, it should make us very thankful uh, for the mercies that he has shown to us. And that thankfulness is something that we should desire to express to the Lord in our worship. And by the way, we should also express it to those who are outside the church to tell, you know, it should motivate us to tell others what he has done for us so that they too might come to know the same love and mercy that we have experienced in the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to magnify and glorify his, his grace, his mercy. The way it's magnified is among us, but it's also magnified by telling other people, pointing them to the one who is merciful, that they too might experience that mercy and that they might come to Jesus and be saved. Well, may the Lord help us to be thankful. As we bow for just a moment of prayer, we, we do need to remember that... Um, that, that election is purely of God's mercy and his love toward us for the praise of his glory, as we've already seen, the glory of his grace. But that love is also what moved him to send Jesus into the world to sacrifice himself so that we might come to know him, that we might be saved, that we might be his, that we might have this inheritance. So Jesus tells us when we come to the table that we are to do this in remembrance of him. And this is what he wants us to remember, all these things that he's done. I mean, not just that he came into the world and laid down his life, but the love of the Father in sending him, that love which is an eternal love, which was an eternal purpose that he might send him, that he might have us as his own. And let me just remind you as well that as we prepare to come to the table, we do need to examine our hearts. So let's do that as well, of our faith and of our repentance. Okay, let's bow for a few moments in prayer and let's prepare to come.